Hey there friends, Dave Politis, Can't End Missing Project, another copyrighted edition for our video channel. And this is a missing persons only video and I'm going to have a few letters for you and a few other things and uh, it's going to be an interesting segment, I guarantee it. So, first of all, I'm going to talk about GHB a little bit. For people who are forgot, GHB has been tied into water-related disappearances. In my humble opinion, I think it's probably tied into all missing persons in one way or another that I've covered. Because GHB leaves the body rapidly. It's not one of the 24 drugs that's commonly on the list for testing an autopsy. And if it wasn't for a secondary autopsy on a Wisconsin missing person case, that uh, the GHB was missed in the first public autopsy. The parents requested a second one and they found it. GHB is one of those real interesting drugs because it's made by the body in very minute quantities. And I've always been fascinated by that one point. So some of you people out there are paying close attention to what I say and I appreciate that. Here's a letter. Thanks for your stimulating video productions. Well, thank you. I like your idea that perhaps GHB is being made or produced within some of the missing person's bodies. Today, if we wanted to collect a dangerous animal, we would shoot them with a dart containing GHB. What if the small slips of metal reported by many abductees is actually a nanomachine used to accelerate their body's production of GHB and is used in place of our antique darts? My supposition is that these small chips are shot into the abductee without them feeling it and this nanotech increases their production of GHB, rendering the abductee effectively paralyzed and helpless. Let me catch you up a little bit. Many people who have claimed they were abducted by some type of entity come back with pieces of odd foreign things in their body, and they're in different places, sometimes at the base of the neck, sometimes behind the knee, and there's been a few physicians that have taken them out that have described them as highly unusual, don't understand how they would have gotten in the body, don't understand why they are there. Some abductees claim that, and you can feel them from the outside of the body and they don't want them removed. So this person obviously has some knowledge of that. I know because I've been a MUFON investigator for a number of years. On with the letter. As with captured wild animals, Perhaps sometimes the dose is incorrectly calculated and the abductee dies. I was a volunteer fireman in Connecticut several years ago when we were called to assist with the capture of a moose that was tranquilized and had its horns sawed off so it could fit into the horse trailer to return it farther north. Unfortunately, something went wrong and the moose died. The vet explained that calculating the proper amount of GHB was somewhat hit or miss, depending upon when it had last eaten and how much. So, his point about humans, I don't know, possible? Who am I to say it's not? There's no way to know if this is what's happening to some of the missing, but I think it's at least worth checking for those very small foreign objects that abductees have reported finding and had removed. To do so just requires an inexpensive metal detector. Obviously, the nano machine would be designed to produce enough GHB to not kill the abductee, but who knows if the victim had eaten enough prior to those nano machines shot into them. I noted that several of the missing were in bars prior to their death. That's the missing that I've written about in Wisconsin and other places. So possibly had empty stomachs and alcohol in their blood, which when combined with GHB might result in their death. Thanks for the great community. Well, in Missing 411, a sobering coincidence, all of the stories in there were essentially about young men, very healthy, out drinking, who disappeared. And there was no track on where they disappeared to. Nobody ever saw them leave the establishment. And this is very well documented. These aren't crappy stories from illogical people. These are very logical stories with very good people who have reported their friends missing. And it's a story that's been re 
retold, retold, retold so many times. It's like a cookie cutter of another. And until you read how many times this has happened, it'll blow your mind. Okay, next story. Hey Dave, I wanted to offer up a hypothesis as to why coroners are not able to find a cause of death in many of these cases. First, as to my credentials, I'm a 40-year-old police veteran and a retired federal agent with a BA in theology. An unusual mix, I know. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. As reading about biblical prophecy that is exploding around us today, when in Luke 21:26, I read where Jesus says that, quote, in the last days men's hearts will faint, fail, them from fear of what's coming upon the earth. Looking up the Greek root for the word faint fall and found it very interesting. 674 point, quote, from Strong's Concordance, to leave off breathing, example fate, not suffocating, just stop breathing. Original word, can't read it. Part of speech is a verb, transliteration, Phonetic spelling AP slash OPS dash OO dash KHO. Definition to leave off breathing. Faint. Usage. I faint, breathe out life, die, am dismayed. It's separate. 674 from 575 separate from and 594 PSYXO breathe, the root of 5590. Properly separate from the soul become faint because of loss of breath. It doesn't say heart attack. Just leave off breathing or separate from the soul. I could be wrong, but I don't see where this would necessarily be medically traceable. Could it be that they literally met something that came up on the earth and yes, had their breath or soul taken in an instant? According to the definition above, anyway, I found it curious Simply food for thought, your brother in blue. Thank you. Thank you. Today I was listening to a show and uh, this person was talking about death, near death experience. I've talked to you about it before. And Leslie Keen has written some fantastic books about this. And I've told you before that I found I, I saw her and uh, Robert Bigelow here in Montana together, and Mr. Bigelow was very interested in life after death. Well, in the show I was listening to today, they talked about a man who had done research, and he had found a blind person who had never seen before. Apparently, died on the operating room table and claimed his soul left his body and he was up above the hospital and he was pretty far gone and they brought him back when he got back and he was alive and healthy enough told the nurses and told his friends what he saw on top of the hospital and it was i forget it was some shoes or clothing but he described them what they look like, the colors. They went up there, they found the shoes. Same color, same everything. This person had never, ever seen before. Lost sight before birth. So, was that their soul that saw this, came back into the body, became a living being again, and then reported it? Well, Leslie has a lot of other stories about life after death that are equally a fascinating but this one the way it was told by the author was very compelling and obviously who's to say it's not true we don't know next letter Dave God bless you for bringing these mental health issues to everyone's attention I'm so sorry for your loss of beloved son Ben my beautiful daughter was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder when she was 26. 
She has never taken drugs or any sort, and no one could explain to us why she developed this awful illness. She tried to take her own life on three separate occasions and spent several years in and out of psychiatric hospitals until her doctors finally got her meds sorted. She has been stable now for nearly seven years and works in a job where she supports other young people suffering from mental health issues. I thank God daily that she never succeeded in taking her own life. My heart goes out to you and to anyone who has lost a child. Keep strong and be assured that you will be reunited with Ben one day. I'm praying for you and all those who are bereaved. A couple things. If you're out there and you're suffering a mental illness condition and you're playing this oh, drug monopoly, I will call it, And I was fortunate because when I was with Ben, we met some pretty good psychiatrists, some really straightforward, and they admitted that it's a crapshoot. What combination of medications work? And going down that road, it's going to be bumpy. <laughs> it's going to be very bumpy. And hopefully, they'll figure it out before it's too late. In Ben's case, he was really smart. <laughs> too smart for his own good. And Ben would go back home and do all the research on all the drugs that they had told him about. And we'd have long talks about it later. And he'd say, Dad, this drug is just horrible on you. Listen to all the side effects and it, kidneys, liver, well, it just ruins everything. And there's no guarantee it's going to work. And everyone says it has this side effect and that. And he said, Dad, I don't want to take any of that. And we had these discussions at length. And until you are a parent and you are in this position and you realize this, that your son can tell the psychiatrist not to tell the parents anything, you can't force your son to take anything or daughter. You can't force them to take anything. They are adults. They have their rights. And you could be completely in the dark. So I walk this balancing line for Ben's life, trying to stay close enough to him so he would allow me to be on the inside to understand what's happening, but yet not be pushy and demanding and lose the trust that he had in me. It's horrible. It is horrible. The laws for mental health for parents and children are horrible. I don't have any answers. But damn it, we have to do something about it. Put a giant task force together of parents like me who have gone through it with parents that are in it and with doctors and we've got to do something. Because the rates of people taking their lives is not slowing down. It's just not being reported. Next letter. Hey Dave. Here are two potentially related encounters I hoped originally to be sharing with you. These happened after a number of encounters after which I was dragged from being a non-believer to a knower. As a result, many experiences from my early life found resolution, puzzle pieces solved by the sudden onset of awareness. These two particular run-ins were had in the central Adirondacks during the summer of 2017. I've decided to advance share these with you because of a letter you read in your recent April 6, 2022 video. In that one, one of your correspondents described meeting some kind of alien creature that resembled a grasshopper or a praying mantis. Once you read my description alone, well, you'll know the similarity. Quick background. For your listeners, I'm in my late 60s, an artist retiring from filmmaking, where I work primarily in New York and Europe as a producer and editor. I'm a strong visual thinker and have a good sense of what I see in nature. I fish whenever I get a chance. Good person. I do at times hunt, but only for the freezer, in New York State makes that activity so expensive for Connecticut nat natives that I've all but given it up. I'm also an inventor. Grounded in natural sciences and mathematics, my partner and I were recently awarded a U.S. patent for a medical device to, to treat glaucoma. 
congratulations. The following account is absolutely true to the best of my recollection. On the afternoon of July 3rd, 2018, I hiked overnight to a small cabin on a lake some three miles distance from our home in the Adirondacks. I was walking the same trail that my father had been pursued along some 20 years before while hiking. The terrain is gradual and sloping and parallels the stream that feeds the lake I was walking towards. The forest along the route has been heavily lumbered, a mix of third growth hardwood mostly. I made the hike in the late afternoon, about three quarters of the way to my destination, I saw a bizarre multi-legged creature crossing the trail in front of me at a distance of about 20 yards. It was crawling in a crab-like fashion and it seemed intent on the scent of something else. It went off rapidly to my right and disappeared in the woods. I only saw it when it crossed the trail and lost sight of it probably three seconds later. It appeared four-legged, but it is possible there was an extra set of appendages appendages, closer to the head, either legs or jaws. I say this because of some protuberances at the head and seem to be moving, yet were held up off the ground. I had a, it had a see-through quality to it, as if it were composed of layers of some unearthly anatomy. It had a whitish coloration and seemed shrouded in diasphanous, diasphanous fabric as if its body parts were protected by a semi-transparent gauze. It climbed over a few fallen logs, moving with a centipede or crab-like motion. Even though the muscul musculature of the rear legs seemed in some ways to be dog-like, in fairness to dogs, the bends in this creature's joints were in the wrong direction. I know that's a lot of conflicting description, but when faced with three seconds of total weirdness, one's brain goes into hyperdrive trying to find explanations. I understand. Backwards facing rear legs, knees bent in the wrong direction, a long body, maybe four feet, length total, no tail, short legs. Was any part of it solid? I wonder to this day. The electronic body seemed almost robotic. A robo dog is a lot taller. It was a full four feet long from the back of its rear legs to the nose, but only 12 to 14 inches tall at most. Overall, it had its proportions of a dachshund, but with a longer neck. It made a clicking or sniffing noise, and it did not move like a mammal. Rather, it scuffed and crawled. To this day, I have no idea what it was, but I surely was glad it counted on. I don't think it noticed me at all. The sniffing and crackling noise could have been due to internal hydraulics or even electric sparks. One could also say the repetitive portion of the sound was a sort of hissing or breathing. Was it electromechanical or was it insectoid? Very hard to tell because it was moving so fast. These are impressions that will stay with me to this day. Months later, I considered if this could have been some people call a crawler. Reports of such beings have occurred in North America. Never heard of it. The thing seemed robotic and under intelligent control, yet at the same time given an aura of something like an enormous cicada. The areas around its body seem clouded by some sort of air in itself. Since listening to your video of April 6, 2022, I appreciated the reference to a man tit or grasshopper. For some reason, this experience didn't ruin my trip at all. In fact, I blissfully forgot about it until days later. Take note of that, please. Yeah, that's weird. I wouldn't have forgot about it. I arrived at the cabin a, cabin a half hour later, made a fire outside in the pit, cooked some dinner, then waited for the sun to set. I was relaxed as I meditated and drank tea to the edge of the lake until the wee hours of the night. It was July 4th weekend. I could hear very distant fireworks. All of a sudden, I got the sudden feeling I wasn't safe. It felt like a cold chill enveloped me. The mist gathering at my small corner of the lake and in the sky above, I went into the cabin and locked the door. During the night, I woke intensely disoriented. Even though I've spent nights in the cabin a half dozen or so times before, I had trouble first locating my flashlight, which I had brought with me, and even the latch on the front of the door of the cabin. How was that possible? This was a place I knew intimately. Yet even an intense survey of the cabin interior with my hands located neither the latch or my light, nor the matches which I had used to start the fire outside. It was as if I had plunged deep into a fog of war. I peed in a cooking pot, gave up wanting to go outside, 
then went back to bed. Sounds like in my college years at a dorm party. In the late, oh, I'm sorry. In the late morning, I awoke. Brilliant sunshine, blue sky. My flashlight was lying on the floor, unbroken, as if I had hit it during the night. Those events still troubled me because I never remembered losing it. After some camp coffee, I doused the fire outside, not in. Then had a swim. As soon as I dressed, a huge rock landed loudly in the water near the camp. I stopped, frozen, then hordes of other projectiles, light in weight and non-destructive, hit the side of the building just feet from where I had enjoyed my breakfast. Pebbles were hurled, would have hurt had they hit me, so my reaction was anger. The stone seemed to be saying, okay, you've had your fun, now you need to get out of here. By this time I had encountered so many different ways that I knew perfectly well who was behind these well-aimed projectiles. Yet never before had I driven out of that area of that force so fast. I considered the go-home request important, so I spoke out loud. Okay, okay, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, just let me pack. The missile stopped. I packed my kit quickly, locked the camp, hid the key, and headed out. On the first turn of the trail, I passed a huge trunk of a fallen red spruce that was sprouting a number of really big reishi mushrooms. I grabbed them and held them in their stipes. In my left hand, the same hand that was cradling one strap of my pack. It was hot and this way of carrying everything allowed my right arm to swing free and kept the hot nylon fabric off my back. For the entire walk home, I mean the whole walk, three miles, I was pursued by this invisible being. Now, at this time though, I had been followed on multiple occasions with vehicles, along trails. This time, the encounter was close. I was nervous, but not afraid. Just, it was just a few feet behind me, yet whenever I turned to look, I saw nothing. Then I felt pine cones being hitting my back. I began to realize that this was a game to my adversary. He didn't mean any harm. It seemed to be wanting to play or talk. Half a mile into the walk, a pine cone landed on the trail in front of me. I reached down and used my right arm like a lacrosse stick to propel it back into the woods. I kept my eyes on where it landed. Suddenly, almost instantly, the same pine cone came rocketing back. I was playing pine cone tennis with my adversary. I couldn't see. I said things like, but you can't get that, and oh, good shot. This went on for the entire rest of the three miles back home. The pine cone would be returned every time. I'd bend over, use my spare right hand to scoop up the pine cone and hurl it somewhere else. Then a split second later, it came back. This was exhausting. I was running out of breath. I did not want under any circumstances to lose the two Raishi mushrooms I was carrying in my left hand. For some reason, they felt like my protection. So I only had my right hand to play pine cone tennis. The act of walking and bending to make these shots really tired me out. Yet I felt that the game somehow kept the encounter real and ultimately safe. Then as I approached the place where the trail opens up into the cleared area of our family settlement, I naturally relaxed my gait and caught a whiff of a smell described by so many, a mixture of wet dog and skunk. Continuing the, sun, the scent made the experience real, confirmed it like a moment of verification. The game of the pine cone tennis was over. Dave, when I consider these two experiences back to back, I wonder if they were in some way related. A number of questions have arisen. Do our northern forests have potentially more than one paranormal threat to hikers such as myself? Could the dog-like cicada thing have been following the scent who in turn was following me? Could the bizarre entity have an electromagnetic function to either self-shield or cause the EMF disturbance such as this one in the pole of an artificial portal could be created as a weapon? Could my forgetting about the afternoon insect-like being have been a guardian calming my mind? And could the same force have essentially used thought implantation to keep my safe leave locked inside, away from matches, away from flashlight, and unable to find the latch. Was a sudden sense of being in danger on the shores of a deserted lake the result of my bodyguard going off duty? I really mean that. I mean, they aren't called watchers for nothing. Whatever that thing was, I'm now convinced the big man had my six for my entire trip. I still feel that in my bones. I wonder if many of the angry encounters campers in Canada and the U.S. have experienced are terrifying but in the end harmless because these beings are trying to frighten city dwellers out of the areas where there was something far more dangerous. 
I don't have any answers to the questions and would love to hear responses from our community. Thank you for reading your incoming letters. The correspondence has taught me the value of the collective mind. So true. Also, thank you for your superior work on the problem of the worldwide missing. Your community runs with the positive help of Ben's spirit. I hope he's on my shoulder looking over right now. I actually feel, Ben, whenever I watch your videos, because whenever I think of your work, I find myself in psychic dialogue with two people, not one. I have a son exactly his age and cannot imagine how you put yourself back together the way you have since that tragedy. Let me tell you, let me tell you something. It hasn't been all good. It hasn't been all beautiful. I've had some absolutely horrible days. I'm convinced Ben is there, helping and watching over you, aiding and abetting all your work, just as I believe the big guy did for me. In the future, I'll be able to supply some puzzle pieces about portals. I'm seeking definitive answers myself, but the big guy has already given me some clues. <laughs> Fascinating letter. Everything that was explained, I've heard that 20, 30 times from other people who have experienced almost the identical same thing. It's not always women. Sometimes it's men. And sometimes it's men that you wouldn't expect to be in that position. What I mean by that, sometimes you think, oh, big, husky, strong. No. A lot of these men were mild-mannered, thin, slight. And they explained that explained that they were intimidated out of it. As she said, well, maybe something is protecting these people from a bad entity that's there, possibly. Possibly, don't know. So we're at that point of the program where you need to grab a coffee, some hot cocoa, Put your feet up. Uh, if you're an FBI agent, grab a croissant. If you're a real law enforcement man, like a cop, go grab a donut. Or two. Or three. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you a couple of stories here that are just absolutely mind-boggling. Now, a couple weeks ago, I told you about a story about a little boy that disappeared from this area I'm going to talk to you about right now. Same area, just a different day. And uh, I think you're going to find this one pretty unreal. This is in Alberta, Canada. Child's name is Kathy Oscard and went to missing September 15th, 1964, about 3 p.m., eight miles northeast of High Prairie, Alberta. So, this is a map. This is Edmonton down here. High Prairie's right here. The other story I told you about occurred right over here, probably less than 10 miles away. And the stories are strikingly similar. Kathy was a slight 16-month-old child, not known to walk away. But uh, she disappeared, they thought, in the bush behind her home, which was up against a forest. The search started almost immediately, and there had been two bears that were in that area near the home that were killed. And they knew that bears came through there all the time. Well, they called in a police dog immediately, and that came traveling fast from Edmonton. Well, the temperatures that night, the night she disappeared, she was last seen about 3 p.m., which is important, folks, because I've told you the most common time for somebody to disappear is 4 p.m. 3 p.m. is close. Well, that night she disappeared, the temps were down to 35 degrees, and it started to rain right after she disappeared. It should mean something to you guys. 
Well, they searched all through the night, calling her name, yelling, screaming, hey, Kathy, come on out, blah, blah, blah. They weren't getting anything. Kenan comes in, doesn't find anything. The next morning, at about 4.30 a.m., searchers started arriving and they were sent out. Right away, 5 a.m., a quarter mile from Kathy's home. That's not very far, folks. Quarter mile away, a searcher hears crying. Walks over, finds Kathy. Yeah. It was in an area that law enforcement said was repeatedly, repeatedly searched. So how did that happen? How did they miss her? Or did they miss her? Was she even there? And if she was crying, why hadn't other searchers found her? Why hadn't Kathy responded to the dozens and dozens of searchers that were calling her name? those searchers, including her family. So the area was repeatedly crisscrossed, but they didn't find her until 5 a.m. Now, what are those profile points? Well, the police dog didn't find her, so that's the canine point. There was a weather-related event. It rained the night she disappeared. She was found in an area that was previously searched and the time of the disappearance, 3 p.m. Now again, when I first started to do research on missing people, I had cases like Kathy's. And I remembered that, you know, I read a case about two weeks ago where a searcher said they, were, they found the victim in an area that Searchers had walked almost daily, and then all of a sudden they were there. I started to make this pile of previously searched, and boom, they're found. And canines hadn't found them. Now that's peculiar, folks. Dogs have good hearing, good sense of smell. So why didn't the canine find Kathy just a quarter mile from the house? Yeah, peculiar. Now, the next, so that was Alberta. Next case, from Ontario, Canada. Uh, an area in Ontario called Chaplow, C-H-A-P-L-E-A-U. Why is that important to me? Well, when I first started to do research on Ontario, there was a story about two men who worked for the railroad up there, had the day off, and went moose hunting. They were never found. There was a massive search outside that city. Massive. And it went on for weeks. They never found one clue of either man. So it's very odd, very odd for two people to disappear and never be found. In this case, it was in that area of Chaplo. Chaplo, I don't know how they'd call it. I'm sure you'll tell me, you always do. This man's name was Edmund Duhane, 19 years old. He was a wildland firefighter who worked for a mill and he was flown into the area east of Chaplow, Chaplow near a town called Bisco Tassing. Let me show you this. This is Sudbury, so you can kind of understand. Chaplow, Bisco Tassing. Important thing on this map, water, water everywhere. The tighter you focus down, the more water you'll see. Water everywhere. There were no roads into this area. The only way that they got in was to fly in. So they're fighting a wildland fire. And Edmund had fought the fire all day, he got up really early ate dinner and then just wanted to walk a little bit and stretch his legs. Told his friends that he'd be back just a short while. He was going to take a short walk. Later that night, he didn't come back. So they started to call for more enforcements. And they brought in 75 men 
and multiple provincial aircraft to search the area. They, learned, they searched along the Mississauga River, not Mississippi, Mississauga. And this is where he was located in his camp. And they thought he might have been in this area. So they, they fought their way through heavy brush to get there. Now, what was odd about this is that First Nations people were called in to do the tracking. I've stated this many times and I will continue to. Native Americans, First Nations people, the best trackers in the world. If you really want to find somebody, bring them in and track. Well, the Indians believed that they tracked something, him possibly, 20 miles south of Bart Lake. But the trail disappeared there and they couldn't understand it. But they found a strange clue. They found a cup made of birch bark. Right away they thought, well, it must be Edmund that did this because they're in the middle of nowhere, no place. Well, on July 16th, the RCMP flew a bloodhound in that was trained in the state of Georgia. It was a phenomenal dog. They put the dog on the latest scent trail. It went nowhere. No scent, no nothing. Never got anywhere. Well, that's weird. Yeah, that is weird. Now, during the search and rescue, rain was almost constant. And that was good and that was bad. It was good because it helped put the fire out that the firefighters were there for. But it also hindered the search and rescue because a lot of the tracks that they were looking for, they couldn't find. And they said part of that cause they thought was, was the rain. Now on July 22nd, Edmund disappeared on July 1st. On July 22nd, 45 miles away, there was a place called Squirrel Lake, also in the middle of nowhere. And two fishermen thought that they heard someone yelling for help. And they couldn't pinpoint the person's location. Called the RCMP in, spent another week searching, didn't find anybody. A very odd occurrence. And would you call that a coincidence or not? Well, Edmund was 19 and he was in the prime of life. So to find tracks that they claim were his possibly 20 miles away would have been a struggle for him. Would have been a big struggle. But it's possible. And then add another 20, 25 miles. And now we're three weeks into him being missing. Possible. I don't think it's probable though. I don't think that someone without food, obviously there's a lot of water, but without food could go that far. I don't know. So the common uh, profile points, water, water everywhere. No tracks at that point where it stopped and the Native Americans couldn't find anymore or the First Nations. No tracks were found. Weather, it rained on and off for the entire search and rescue. And the canines they brought to the scene didn't find anything, couldn't track anything. Let's stop here for a second. If you've been with me more than five or six of these videos, these should start taking shape in your mind and say, these just cannot be happenstance. How many times has Dave said, canines can't find a track or canines can't find a scent, trackers can't find a track, weather inhibits the search, that on and on, missing clothing, whatever it is. This is exhaustive research. Nobody's ever done it. And so you can say, well, maybe it's just all a coincidence. But the number of times I've told you this has happened, it's been hundreds. How many times have I documented it? Coming up on 2000 now. So, this next case, always leave the best for last. In my years of researching missing people, I stated earlier, 
having two people disappear is really odd. Having three people disappeared, nearly unheard of. In this case, there's three. This incident occurred August 28, 1897 in a place called Wagga Wagga, Australia. Now, where is that? So, this is the east coast of Australia. This is Melbourne. This is Wagga Wagga. Now, this is Sydney up here. And I've been on this coastal range before. Absolutely pristinely beautiful. I love Australia. I'll say it many times. It's one of the best trips of my life. The people were super friendly. Uh, the food was outstanding. I like fish anyhow, so. Now, I'll give you a closer view of where we're talking about in a second. So, August 28th, 1897. Three kids. Daisy is five. Elsie is four. And Anastasia is three. And they all have the last name of Kendall. And three of the kids were all related because two of them belonged to one brother and the one belonged to another brother. And they lived in the same area almost across the street from each other. The incident occurred 14 miles west of Wagga Wagga. And I'm sorry, 14 miles east of Wagga Wagga. And at that point, the kids were out playing in the afternoon. And they came back, and as they were coming back towards their home, they found a log, and inside the log, they found a possum. Well, young girls being young girls, the oldest one had a brilliant idea. They weren't very far from home, so she goes, I'm going to go get something so we can get this thing out of the log. They thought it was trapped or something. So she comes back with a pick or something to try to pry it out. I know, it's kids. So she gets back to the log and Elsie and Anastasia are gone. So Daisy goes out and they can determine this by the tracks. Elsie and Anastasia had walked away. Well, a man who lived nearby saw the girls walk through a fence towards Kayamba, K-Y-E-A-M-B-A Creek. And they said, the, the witness said, yeah, they didn't, they didn't go all the way down to the creek. They kind of went down to this area under a tree and they kind of hung out. And then I just didn't think more about it. Well, about eight o'clock that night, a very strong storm came into the area. Every article said it. It was a huge storm. Right about that time, the brothers got very nervous about where their girls were. And they called the police, they called other villagers, and they started searching. Massive search. They were calling people in from 100 miles away. Now, this is Wagga Wagga. This left edge here is the creek pretty rural area, pretty desolate. So, massive search, five days, and they're really frustrated, and they don't understand it because they've, they've covered areas dozens of times. They know that uh, these kids should be in an area close by their home, and they're absolutely stunned. Well, that storm was told that it never let up. It went nonstop and it washed away a lot of tracks, everyone believed. Well, five days of nonstop rain and on September 2nd, about a three quarters of a mile from where the Kendall's home was, there was a woman there named Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones came outside with her daughter and noticed some crows flying above a rocky very rocky ridge about three quarters of a mile from her house and people that live in the bush know that when crows start circling something's dying they know this and most searchers in america know this as well 
If those crows have eyes on something, save a lot of time and go follow the crows. Well, the woman walked up to the ridge and the first thing she came upon was very odd and it was noted in every article. She found a dead lamb. She didn't know quite what to make of that. And just a very short distance later, she came across Daisy, Elsie, and Anastasia laid down in a line, all face down, all facing their home, all missing their shoes and hats, all were dead. Needless to say, Mrs. Jones was stunned. She called the police. Police came out, looked at the scene. There was no obvious signs of violence on the body, according to the police. Now here's a quote from the police in the article. It said, the police are mystified that searchers did not discover the kids. Because the searcher didn't find the kids. A neighbor did. I went on to say that searchers had crisscrossed that area many times. Didn't find the boy or didn't find the girls. It was later said that the kids died of exposure and they had been dead four to five days. A couple, a couple huge issues with this case. I don't care who you are. You don't lay down and die in a group. We've talked about this family just outside of Yosemite National Park where a husband, a wife, their baby, and their dog all were found in this small area, all dead. And they said it was from uh, whatever they said, it was ridiculous. I, but they were all together. And I said then, that doesn't make sense. People don't all die at the same period of time. Children all don't die at the same period of time. Everyone has a different set of abilities built into them that are different from everyone. Now, in this instance, they were next to a creek when they disappeared. Weather was horrible. It rained for five days. They were missing clothing, shoes. And exposure was the cause of death. And they were in an area that was previously searched. Why weren't the kids found? Or why didn't they respond to the parents and everyone who searched for them that first day? doesn't make any sense. Kids would respond. Three of them together in the same place, looking the same direction, all with the same body position. Friends, I'm sorry. I don't buy it. Do, do I believe Mrs. Jones? Oh, absolutely. But what about the clothing? They were lightly clad, the article said. Well, what about their shoes? What about their hats? They never said they were found. And remember, the searchers crisscrossed this area many, many times. They should have found the kids' clothing. They never did. And you know what? That's one particular thing that's unusual about almost every search I talk to you about where people are disappeared and they're later found and they're missing something that searchers don't find it. I've read hundreds of search and rescue reports where searchers find pieces of jewelry, small little pieces of evidence. That's how good searchers are. To not find a major clue like a piece of clothing or a shoe, not reasonable. What do I think happened here? I think something really, really strange happened as I've said before in many of my other cases. I don't think that children would not respond, at least one of them, to a call for searchers. I also, in my heart, don't believe that they would all die simultaneously. They didn't die all comforting each other. They weren't huddled up. They weren't didn't have their arms around each other like they were freezing. No, they were lined up. Very odd. 
and they were all facing the same direction. And the, the articles all described three quarters of a mile from their home and three quarters of a mile from Mrs. Jones' home on a very rocky ridge. Kind of reminds me of a boulder field. Just saying. So I've given you two cases from Canada, one case from Australia. And you Australian people, there's other videos on this channel that I did when I was in your country on a book tour about missing people. And they were in the Blue Mountains, some of them, and the other, other videos I did were closer to the coast. But yeah, they were, they were interesting cases. Still haven't been solved. So please go over to my channel and watch. I now have close to 250 videos on this channel and every one I would appreciate it if you watched. I'll remind you again that just recently we were advised by YouTube that they decided to put our videos up, our documentaries, correct that, up on this channel, on their channel to watch for free. And the links to Missing 411 and Missing 411 The Hunted are on my description of this video. Watch it multiple, multiple times, please. Because a lot of times people have told me they've watched it once and they don't pick up everything that's really there. I need to tell, because tell you this, that some people have questioned me on, well, Dave, the people that, that aren't actors that you just interviewed, how many times did you interview them before you videotaped this? Uh, no, I, I interviewed people one time. I want you to see the reaction they're giving to me when they talk. That's important. These witnesses in these movies, a lot of them are just destroyed inside. A lot of them have a story to tell and nobody's really ever asked them for it. In Missing 411 The Hunted, the son of one of the guys who disappeared told me that he heard a specific noise. I said, well, did you tell searchers that? And he said, well, I don't think they were interested. I'm interested. It was an unusual noise. And the fact that these people are not found, even though some of them are highly disabled, makes no sense at all. So before you pass judgment on my work, watch, watch the, the documentaries. And then I've had probably a hundred people in the last two years say, Dave, I haven't read a book in 10 years, but your research was compelling enough. I bought the book and you know what? Three days later, I read the whole book. I haven't read a whole book in probably 20 years. I haven't read a book in 10 years, but I haven't completed a book in 20 years. So I appreciate those comments. And I think it goes towards not, not my good writing because I'm not that good a writer, but the stories are good. And the facts in those stories are compelling. So, we're right at the end of another video. I, I can't even tell you how humbly appreciative I am of all of you being here. And uh, I'm, always, I'm always grateful that anyone wants to watch these videos. We're in some tough times, folks, very tough times. And if there's some escape for you where I can get your mind to wrap around a to topic where we as a mass need to wrap our minds around if we're ever gonna figure it out. And rather than ridiculing me for opening my mind and my channel up to ideas that you may not believe, but if true, could unlock the puzzle, be patient with me. Be patient with the audience if you're new here. Just a couple of rules I have. Don't be mean, don't be abusive, be kind to each other here on this channel. And you know what? The vast, vast, vast majority of you are just stellar individuals who post outstanding content and polite things to each other. Wow, I'm so lucky. 
In the meantime, do something nice for a neighbor, something nice for somebody at the store. It'll make you feel better about yourself. It'll make that person feel good. And you're just being a good person. In this day and age where there are some bad people in our world, and there are some people who I think we're in a spiritual battle with, we all need to have grace. and We all need to have respect for one another. So, thank you. See you soon. Politis out.